All right, great. Um, so welcome everybody um, to Career Exploration for Humanities and Social Science PhDs. Um, really nice to have you here today. Um, this is our agenda um, and the things um, that I hope you'll take away by the end of this presentation. Um, so first objective is to understand the broader career diversity context for humanities and social science PhDs. We'll look at a little bit of data about this. Um, second, to learn about tools and resources for career exploration so that you know this presentation is kind of just the beginning. Um, and then the idea is you'll go off and do a lot of research and exploration on your own. Um, and finally, to help you set some goals for your own career exploration process and what your next steps will be after today's presentation. Um, so first, um, just like to get a sense for who all is here. Um, so if you could, um, so Lauren is going to be helping out today by putting a lot of um, links and, and other useful things in the chat. Um, so she has put in the chat a link to a Google slideshow. Um, if you can't edit it, let me know, but I set it so that you should all be able to. And with the slideshow, so the very first slide, we actually borrowed this from um, another colleague at a different institution who had done an exercise like this. So I see a lot of you are in the slideshow, which is a good sign. Basically, um, take a dot um, take, uh, for each of these questions, it doesn't matter what color dot, and put it um, where you feel you fit along the spectrum and answer to these various questions. So the first question is on the spectrum of feeling on the one hand scared and on the other hand excited about, about post-graduation plans, where would you say you are? Um, next one on the spectrum of I have never thought about what I will do post graduation to I think about it all the time, where would you say you are. Next the spectrum from I have no idea what my qualifications are beyond academia, on the one hand, to I'm already considering a few options, um, where would you say you fall. Um, and then the last one asks about what your feelings are about networking, because um, that is something that we'll be talking about today and how networking can help with your career exploration. So take a few moments to let you move those dots around. And I see some of you are already moving them. And you can kind of all see what your um, what the other folks here are doing with their dots. Okay, great. Well, so far, um, this group is skewing toward, um, I'm guessing for a lot of you, this is not your first step on the career exploration process, because some of you already, um, many of you, I think, are kind of toward the middle of the spectrum um, over to the, um, you're actually, you know, you're feeling ambivalent about post-graduation plans but you've done a little bit of thinking already about what you might do. Um, and that's some people, you know, it has not crossed their minds. So obviously you're here today, um, but it seems like you've already spent a little bit of time thinking about it. So um, thank you for um, letting us know who you are and some of your, and I'll, um, you know, that's open so you can continue to fill that in. Okay, so first place I wanted to start is a little bit of myth busting, um, which is adapted from a book that I highly recommend um, called, uh, So What Are You Going to Do With That? Um, it's one of the single best resources, I think, for thinking about careers beyond academia. Um, the first myth is that no one will hire you and that you have no useful skills or experience to contribute. Um, so that's not true. And as we'll see from the data, um, PhDs in the humanities and social sciences are employed in many different places. Second, uh, my dissertation is my most valuable asset. Um, as a PhD student, that's, it's true, it's one of your most valuable assets to earn your doctorate. Um, afterward, um, it doesn't, it's not, and it certainly doesn't have to be. Um, and so there are many other aspects of your experience that can become even more valuable than your dissertation. Um, next, if I don't become a professor, my PhD was a waste of time and effort. Um, again, 
not true at all. There are so many um, expected and unexpected ways that getting a PhD and the skills you learn and the experience you have and the networks you develop um, become very useful in a really wide variety of career paths. And again, a lot of these things are unexpected and might even happen not in your first job post-graduation, but even later on down the line that you find that having this experience is very useful. Um, not to mention just like thinking about the moments um, of joy and fulfillment you've gotten from the process of getting a PhD, even if some of parts of it have not been um, joyful. Um, next, uh, people who work in the business world are stupid and boring. Um, you know, people fear, you know, what will it be like? What will the work environment be like? What will my colleagues be like if I go into something else? Um, there are many different kinds of people in the world. There are many smart, interesting people in all different kinds of careers. Um, obviously, this is all um, kind of caricatured, but um, next jobs in the business world are stupid and boring. Again, there are lots of very fulfilling, intellectually rewarding um, jobs all over um, in both the private sector, public sector, nonprofit world. Um, and this is one that we hear a lot um, that PhDs feel that they are, on the one hand, overqualified in terms of education, but on the other hand, underqualified in terms of experience for most jobs. Um, and for this, um, we won't actually spend too much time getting into this today, um, but the way to address that is really through how you tell your own narrative about yourself and your experience. And that's the best way to demonstrate to potential employers how your experience um, is still you know, a good fit for whatever the position is that you're applying for. So um, try to get them to see you not just for the credentials you have or the number of um, years of formal work experience you have, but rather for how the sum total of all of your experience and knowledge and skills prepares you uh, for whatever position you're applying for. So that's sort of part of a later conversation about um, writing job search materials like a resume or a cover letter um, and also about interviewing. Okay, so next, um, I just wanna start this conversation to from a place of strength and um, rather than deficits um, by pointing out some transferable skills um, that all graduate students develop and where you have had the chance to learn and demonstrate these skills. Um, Lauren also put back in the chat another link to that same slideshow. And it's an opportunity for you all to think, um, to reflect a little bit about your own strengths um, as, we, as I talk about these skills. So you can kind of both fill that in um, while I'm talking about these transferable skills. Um, but basically you'll each take a blank slide and put your, you can just do your first name, a strength, and then some kind of image or representation of that strength. Um, and this can be a like a personal quality, something about your personality, it can be a skill you have, um, it can be a piece of knowledge you have, uh, but something that you feel is a real strength of yours, an asset that you would contribute um, in a professional way. So first, research. Um, and I think PhD students tend to take for granted their research skills because it's been um, such kind of an automatic part of what you do um, every day in, in writing your dissertation and in you know, all of the other papers and, and research that you've done. But in fact, um, it's a very, it's an unusual skill set and people who have spent a longer time in the professional world don't have as much of an opportunity to develop it like you do. So what is, but then you have to unpack it uh, for an employer sometimes. So, you know, you, you spend three to four years writing a dissertation, you know, researching, but what does that mean? And again, to, to emphasize transferable, how does that transfer to the context that you're now looking at? Um, so one way to unpack research is determining the research questions. So if you know, you're given a big project or assignment at a new employer, um, how would you approach it? What kinds of questions would you ask first? Where would you go for information? Um, how would you design you know, a, a research project? And this could be something large or small, you know, something that's you get a week to you know, think about, uh, develop a proposal for some, for a new program or um, you know, in, in consulting work that you're you know, presented with a new client or something like that. But PhD students um, have a very, very well-developed ability to figure out um, how to learn new things and where to learn new things. And then also to synthesize your findings in 
writing and verbally and persuade others and defend your conclusions. That's kind of all about what making these research arguments is about. Um, so again, when you apply for jobs outside of the academy, it might not matter so much, say what your dissertation research was about if you find that you're moving to a field that's not related, but your ability to research, to design the project, and then to defend it, to construct and defend an argument is something that is really highly valued and rare. Um, so next, written communication. Um, of course, the dissertation, you've written papers for class. And this is a piece where, you know, if as a graduate student, you can gain some experience writing for other contexts, it's really great to have had that experience writing for different audiences or writing different kinds of communication, um, even if it's just like, you know, flyers for a student group you're in or something. That's still a way, a different form of written communication that is, that is good experience. Project management. So this is a dissertation, um, is an exercise in project management. And again, when we're talking about translating this to an audience that's outside of the academy who maybe themselves didn't go through a PhD program, you kind of have to break down um, what that, you know, again, you spend three or four years working on something, what are the component parts of that? And so that's something you can do in a resume or you can explain in a job interview um, what, what, you know, this project that you spent so much time on, um, you know, first you did, you know, you organized trips to archives in different places. Um, you organized um, systems for managing large volumes of information. You know, if you use however you do your citations or Zotero or, you know, all of those things. So again, you're gonna have to translate it for a different audience, but you have those project management skills. Leadership. Um, so this is something, another thing that I see a lot of PhD students doing is they're not quite sure what to do with their teaching experience. That usually on a CV, you have a section that's teaching and you list all the courses that you've taught. Um, and that's because the CV is for an audience where you're applying to teach as well. And so mostly they're interested in, you know, what have you taught and what could you teach at my institution? But if you're applying for a non-teaching job, Sometimes it's not, you know, the class itself, if you taught, you know, introductory Latin, it's not that you're going to be teaching introductory Latin in your next job, but rather those mentoring, leadership, again, communication, uh, the creativity and lesson planning, um, the evaluation you do in grading, um, all of those things um, that, that make up the teaching that are going to be highly valued um, and demonstrate those leadership skills. Critical thinking, um, so this is also kind of amorphous, um, but this is something that comes across in, um, especially if you get to the interview stage of applying for jobs, just kind of seeing the way that you think and have been trained to think as a doctoral student, um, that your, your skills in this area are very, very strong. Um, again, you'll have to translate it into a new context, but um, very um, highly sought after strengths of PhD students. So collaboration, um, that's another kind of tricky one because I think a lot of you know PhDs, especially in the humanities um, and in some social sciences can be quite isolating because actually a lot of the work that you're doing is solitary, the research and the writing. Whereas a lot of work environments are at least to some extent collaborative. So one thing that I think some PhD students are up against when they apply for jobs outside of the academy is this stereotype or perception that PhD students are uh, not good collaborators, we don't have experience working on teams or kind of, you know, are lone wolves trying to, you know, like do their own thing. When in fact, um, you've had some experience with collaboration, again, by teaching is one of them, even if you've been a TA, then to some extent, you've had a collaborative relationship with a faculty member and being a TA for their course. Um, anything that you've done, again, like student group work, student government, um, things that you've done um, outside of the classroom, um, all you know, are examples of collaboration. And then of course, if you've actually done any collaborative research or writing, that's also um, a really big asset. But so these are things that you might have to in representing yourself um, to a future employer um, and in kind of thinking about this career exploration process and reflection, the pieces, um, to what extent you want collaboration to be a part of your work life going forward and how you've done it in the past and on what terms you like to collaborate and would be looking for that. Um, public speaking, um, again, teaching, but also uh, conference talks and even, you know, days when you've had to present in seminar, um, all examples of verbal communication as well. 
Um, so these are all skills that you um, have developed and we'll talk in just a couple minutes about some um, self-assessment and reflection tools to think about, you know, some of these are maybe skills that you have, um, but skills that you don't want to be using in a work environment, or maybe some of them you wish um, you could use them more in a work environment. So like one that I hear most often is that collaboration that you get, you know, few natural opportunities to do it during graduate school, but um, a lot of people are, um, you know, would like for a work environment where you have more opportunity to collaborate. So then how does that inform the career exploration process? Okay, so now I'm just gonna do a um, quick little run through of, uh, to answer that question, where are the PhDs? Um, because a question that we get a lot in, in career advising is, what are my options and where do people go? Um, so first there've been, um, there's a lot of research on this um, and Lauren's gonna paste into the chat some really great links. Um, one of my favorites, even if, actually I actually don't think there are any historians here, but even if you're not a historian, the American Historical Association, their career diversity project has these really great um, visualizations of the data that they've collected about where PhDs are. And so you can see it from a very macro level of like how many are in uh, you know, tenure track jobs, but then also they have ways of representing like individual job titles and you know where people actually are. And so um, the bottom line is people, some PhDs are pretty much everywhere. Um, so here's one set of data. This is doctoral recipients in the two decades between 96 and 2016. Um, these are, so first the, the shape, the colored parts are the ones that um, students that have definite plans for employment. So the first thing when you look at humanities to notice, oops, is that um, only a little over 50% by at the point at which the survey was conducted had definite plans already post-graduation. Um, and in this case, many more were employed than in postdocs. And of course, once you get over to the sciences, it's much more common to do a postdoctoral fellowship after you finish, but that's becoming more and more common in the humanities and social sciences too. Um, so of those with definite plans who are domestic, so not international students, um, their immediate post-graduation plans for the humanities, a lot of them was academia, and that doesn't differentiate between types of positions within academia, but then you do see other government, industry, nonprofit, and unknown. So again, this is the um, just a little snapshot of some of the data from the American Historical Association, um, and you can, and this also differentiates between, so this is for all PhDs within this 10-year period, um, and I actually forget when this data was collected now, but it might've been like 2018-ish. Um, so for PhDs in that 10 year period where they were in um, when this data was collected. So a little less than half by that point. And again, this is people who, are, who were at that point between like five and 15 years out. Um, a little less than half had tenure track jobs uh, of historians. Um, and then otherwise you can see um, tenure track jobs at a four year institution then tenure track at two year. Um, then you can see people are in staff, private sector, nonprofit, other things. And then um, here is data from the Modern Language Association. Um, and this was, is a bit of a different data set because it was in, 26, in 2017 um, where all, for, for those that they surveyed where um, modern language PhDs were. Um, and so you could see it's, um, so it's not necessarily, it's people who graduated and not just a 10 year period, but a much broader period. So again, you can see, um, you know, half end up as tenured faculty, but that leaves a whole other half that are doing, um, that have different kinds of careers than that. Okay, so that's just to say, um, you know, you can dig into that and I really encourage you to follow those links that Lauren put in because I think it kind of opens your mind a little bit to what the possibilities might be. Um, and just to see, you know, in, cause sometimes it can feel like, oh, everybody's going on to one thing and I'm thinking about something else. And first of all, you probably know other people who are thinking about other things, but even if you don't, you can just kind of see from the data that people go to lots of different places. Okay, so now um, what are some tools and resources? Um, so you said this would be the second, learning objective, um, how are you going to do this exploration? Um, so first um, is really just kind of inward looking um, and rather than outward looking. Um, and there's uh, a range of different ways to do that. So one way is um, 
to do um, self-reflection in a variety of different ways, just taking stock of grad your graduate school experience um, as kind of a proxy for what it would be like to uh, be a faculty member or you know, thinking about the next steps in your career. So what are the things you liked? What are the things you didn't like um, or, or present tense do like and don't like? Um, what would you want to change? Um, so Lauren, again, put in the chat a link to the same Google um, slideshow, in this case, pointing you toward the very last slide in the slideshow, which is a, just a really simple exercise, but to get you to disaggregate um, the particular experiences and think about what did you like about the content of that experience. So if we say, you know, graduate school or writing a dissertation, what in terms of what you actually did, did you like? Um, what in terms of the environment did you like? So that could be, you know, I actually, you know, I like that when I write my dissertation, you know, I like, so for what did you like? It could be, I liked working in the archives. Um, I liked, having a flexible, in terms of then environment, I liked having a flexible schedule and setting my own hours. Um, what did you not like about the content? Um, I didn't like having to uh, take, you know, keep track of all of my citations. I found that tedious. <laughs> uh, what did you dislike about the environment? Uh, disliked the isolation. Um, and then the last column is influence of personal factors at the time. So it could be, oh, and, there was a global pandemic, so maybe that affected, you know, things. So that's just like a um, gets you to think about, okay, well, if this same thing were, if I were doing the same thing, but in a different context, or if I was in a different place in my life, like, would I feel differently about it? Um, so that's one just kind of really simple exercise that you can do on your own. Um, and I would encourage you um, to think not only about, um, you know, dissertation, teaching, um, you know, those kinds of things, but even what other experiences have you had, um, especially if you can think about something you really liked doing, like if it was a volunteer experience or a part-time job you had at one point, um, or, you know, something, it can be something that's very informal, um, but taking that experience and thinking about, um, you know, picking that apart to see how that might be able to inform your exploration going forward. Um, so next, there are also there are tools to help you do this. So it's more sophisticated tools, and um, so our favorite one is called Imagine PhD. Um, and I'm going to be talking about this in a little bit more depth in a minute. Um, so I won't say more about that now. Um, and then obviously, of course, one-on-one -on -one career advising. So that's why Francesca and I are here in GSAS Compass for those of you who are GSAS students. Um, if you're a postdoc, you can meet with the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs because they also do one-on-one -on -one career advising. So sometimes it can just be really helpful to have a sort of disinterested third party to talk to about these things. So next, um, research. So there are um, a lot of like post alt ac post PhD, you know, lots of terms for this. Um, blogs, articles, literature that you can read through um, it, online industry specific resources and guides. So if you already have some senses of things that you might be interested in, um, don't underestimate the power of Googling. Even if you like, as one just place to start, if there's something you're curious about and you don't know, you know, go down a little bit of a rabbit hole on Google and see what you can find out about it. Um, next, LinkedIn and alumni research. So I encourage all of you to create LinkedIn profiles if you don't already have one. Um, and LinkedIn is useful for lots of different things. Um, of course, for active networking, it can be, um, that's, you know, kind of how they market themselves. But LinkedIn is actually a really good research tool as well. So you can look up um, as a means of exploration, you can look up whether it's people you know who've graduated from your program, or you can just do a search on LinkedIn for you know somebody with a you know PhDs in sociology and see what you come up with and see where they are. Um, so these are all ways that you can research to help you explore and think of possible paths for yourself. Um, next, and we'll talk about this. Um, a little bit more in depth later too, is doing informational interviews. Um, so an informational interview is a conversation between a job seeker or a career explorer. So that would be you. Uh, and then somebody who has a job or has had a trajectory that you're interested in. And so the idea is that you are interviewing this person for information about their personal story and about the field that they work in. Um, and so this is a really great way too of kind of vicariously testing out 
um, and exploring different career paths by talking to people who are in those fields. Finally, um, another means of exploration is to actually do a little bit of um, what you might be interested in. So I think a lot of people think that means that you need to have an internship. Um, and that's, I think, sort of the most extreme way of gaining experience. And I, I am an advocate for trying to do some kind of internship while you're in a PhD program, but some people don't have time or aren't you know, in the circumstance where they can do that or aren't sure they want to do something that's uh, make that much of a commitment to have like a summer internship. So other things you can do are, um, you could take on a part-time job in you know, a field that you're interested in. Um, you can also just do volunteer work around campus or around the city and also get involved on campus. So you can check out, um, like I think the ASGC is a really great opportunity to get involved and to gain some really good experience with collaborating, um, meeting other students who have different interests. And so you can kind of get ideas and get exposed and build your network with your peers that way. Uh, but also, you know, did there are other, many other different, um, whether it's clubs or fellowships, um, the Heyman Center has a lot of great fellowships for humanities PhD students. Um, Columbia Tech Ventures has a fellowship program that um, is open to people in any discipline who are interested in gaining, um, you can gain a little bit of business or entrepreneurship experience there. Um, so there's a ton of experience, a ton of opportunities on campus um, to gain experience in a way that can go alongside with coursework, teaching, dissertation, and won't set you off track or set you behind. Um, so these are um, the, primary, the primary methods for exploration, um, self-reflection, online research, talking to people and gaining some actual experience. Okay, so now I'm gonna just spend a couple minutes talking about Imagine PhD. Um, so Lauren put the link in the chat. And this is something that um, the last part of what we were gonna talk about is next steps. Um, so I suggest for all of your next steps that you um, grab this link and create a profile. It only takes a couple of minutes. It's a free tool. Um, and that you use it. And the way to use it is to begin by taking the three self-assessments. There's an interest assessment, a skills assessment, and a values assessment. Um, each of these takes about five minutes. Um, they're not very long, and it's just a set of questions about things you're interested in, what skills you have, and then things that are important to you in terms of your work life and your work environment. Um, and I'll just say um, about this tool, and let me... Um, change my screen share actually to show you the tool. Um, so here it is. Um, it was developed by a large group of graduate career counselors from across the country. Um, and it began development in about 2013. And um, because these career counselors recognized that there was a tool actually that had been designed for students in the life sciences called my IDP or my individual development plan. Um, but it was very science specific. So all of the career paths and all the questions that it asked about had to do mostly with lab based sciences. And so it wasn't a good tool for humanities and social science PhDs. So this group of career counselors got together um, put together a very large committee to develop a new tool um, that then went live. Um, I'm not, I forget exactly what year it went live, but it took them a few years to develop it. And it continues, the same group continues to maintain it and update the content. Um, so it's actually, it's a really fantastic resource. So um, I'll just, so, and it will always be free. That's part of their pledge too. <laughs> so it'll never ask you for money. Um, so this is why your start is with um, doing the three assessments. Um, other ways to explore the tool are to look in the resources section and in particular the job family resources. So the creators of this tool have put together um, 15 different sections based on the most common career paths for humanities and social science PhDs. And, um, so the, and another way to use this tool then, the Imagine PhD tool, is to click on, you click on all of them um, or click on something that seems interesting to you um, and you wanna learn more about it. So we'll just look at um, higher education administration as an example. And once you get in, every job family looks the same. So it'll have examples of 
job titles. Um, and again, I find even this sort of eye-opening because a lot of times in higher ed administration, as a graduate student, you don't see, um, you get kind of a narrow slice of what the options are um, at a university in terms of working in administration. But even just looking at this list, you can see, oh wow, right, there's you know a program manager at an institute at a law school, you know, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that as a humanities research scientist um, or um, a, so an academic advisor for undergraduates or a senior online producer, I wonder that is. So we're looking at something in communications at a university. So again, there, there are many, many different roles. Um, and then within here too, you can, um, there are lots of then resources that point out to different other sites um, within that job family. So this is very, it's industry specific. Um, I also just want to show you this section, if you go to the apply section, and this is sort of for a later conversation again, but each of these job families has at least one sample analyzed annotated job description, a sample resume, and a sample cover letter. Um, so then you can see when we go back to, if you think about those strengths and transferable skills, how those actually get represented on paper for different industries um, and their examples here. Um, so again, this is just, um, a, a can't recommend this tool highly enough. So that's the um, kind of number one post workshop tip. So let me change my screen share back to the presentation. Okay, and then um, just to help you kind of do one more step on your own too, um, in terms of next steps after this, um, in terms of how to interpret your results if you do do one of these assessments or even do some of that self-reflection. It's like, okay, so I, now I know these things about myself, what do I do? Um, so first, once you are kind of more in touch with your interests, what does this do? So first, uh, it could open up new possible paths um, and help you to explore those paths now that you know that they exist and know how to articulate them. Um, it can help you evaluate the tasks you enjoy and their prevalence in each job family. It can help you eliminate job families that are of very little interest. Um, and it can also help you to identify tasks that you don't enjoy, um, again, to help you with the elimination. Um, I think it can also be helpful because sometimes with interest, people think, um, you know, you've been, for some people, their area of research is, um, you know, the foremost interest that they have. And sometimes, it is possible to continue working in a field that aligns with that interest. And sometimes it's not. And so I think thinking more about the broader range of interests can help again to open up different areas. So skills, um, knowing more about your skills. First, I think it's just a matter of articulation. And again, this gets back to the translation um, and transferability of your skills that um, thinking about disaggregating your skills from the context in which you've used them can help you then articulate those skills to a new audience. Um, it can also, being more in touch with your skills can also help identify skills you want to develop. So there might be some areas where um, you recognize that you don't have a particular skill, but you actually think you have an aptitude or think it might be useful professionally. Um, next, by, by using the Imagine PhD tool or even just in you know, doing your own research or talking with people, being in touch with the skills that you have can help you then pursue particular jobs within a job family that play to your strengths. So <clears throat> what I mean by that is say, um, we'll take, we'll go with higher education as the job family. So higher education is just, that's an industry, but there are a lot of different functions, a lot of different jobs within that industry. And so how do you know, um, and those jobs look very different from one another. So how do you know what you are, um, what would be the best fit and impart your skills can help with that. So if you are, you know, if you love, love, love working with students um, and that's been, you know, something, a real, a real skill that you have working one-on-one -on -one with students and maybe student advising is something to pursue within the job family of higher education. Um, if instead you um, really love, yeah, like design and communication, then maybe you want to be in a communications office for a university or a school. Um, so again, understanding what your skills are and what you want to be doing in a job can help you decide what actual, what job titles and job functions to look at. Then in it, for any misalignments, so places where you're, you don't have a skill that is needed or that you have the skill but don't like using it, 
then the question is, um, you know, do I want to acquire that skill set? Can I acquire that skill set? Um, if so, how? And so a question that we get a lot from humanities and qualitative social scientists is about quantitative skills. Um, and there, I think I usually push back a little bit on students to ask, because uh, there's a perception that for many job fields, you need quantitative skills, um, but sometimes that's not always true. So first, um, and then second, if you do need the quantitative skills, uh, that's a very general term. So then the question is, well, what, actually, what do I actually need to be able to do in order to get a job? Um, and that's a very specific question that needs to be accompanied, needs to be answered by industry research and informational interviews. So, um, so again, rather than kind of just thinking of it as like a general deficit of I don't have quantitative skills, yeah, and pinpoint exactly what quantitative skills are necessary and I, I really emphasize to get the job you want, because sometimes there are many skills you can learn once you already have a job too. And so in some cases, it's more an aptitude um, rather than demonstrating that you already have a skill. But if you do need it, um, then how would you acquire that skill? And the last area is values. Um, and I think values are something that kind of that sometimes get lost or elided in these conversations, but they're extremely important because if you have a job or in an industry that does not align with your values, you probably will not be happy. Um, so um, it's something, it's very important to listen to your values and your values can be, um, you know, like, do you want a nine to five job or do you really not want a nine to five job? Um, geography is a value. Um, how much money, you know, what the salary is, that's a value. And so these are things that you kind of have to think about what your priorities are in terms of your values and keep those at the forefront as you're doing this exploration. Um, so values can be aligned with particular organizations and jobs, but not necessarily, sometimes they could be aligned with entire job families, um, but not always. Um, Knowing your values, again, can help you when you're um, knowing and being able to articulate them you know, as appropriate can really be helpful in, um, in narrowing down and kind of honing what the possibilities might be for you. And again, just want to end by emphasizing that values are just as important as skills and interests. Okay, so this, I'll share these slides, because um, this is like a dump of information on this slide, but also um, Lauren just put into the chat the link that's at the bottom, and this is to our website, um, our GSAS Compass website, and it's it has all of these resources on it. Um, so these are just um, for that internet research. Um, these are some of the best resources. Um, Intersect Job Simulations is a really great one that's actually put together uh, by the same people who put together, uh, or an overlapping group of people as those who came up with Imagine PhD. And these are, um, you know, they'll say like a, a job, um, so like business consulting, um, and then what's a sample thing that you'd actually have to do in that job. And so that's another great way, especially if you can't, if you haven't yet found someone to do an informational interview with, um, and you want to ask, like, just, I hear this job, but what, what is it? Like, what do you actually do? Um, and that's a fantastic resource for that. Um, and beyond that, these are other um, just really highly recommended resources to um, to become familiar with, to check, um, especially with Carpe Careers, beyond the professoriate, professors in, these are all updated frequently. Um, the others are kind of more static resources. And then finally, Higher Education Recruitment Consortium at the end is a job board for jobs in higher education for those who are interested in that. Okay, so the last thing we'll talk about today is informational interviewing as a resource um, for career exploration. So I already defined um, what an informational interview is, a brief conversation between a person who wants to investigate a career and a person working in that career. So these are short, usually 20 to 30 minutes. Um, they can be any modality. Um, usually you, it's polite to defer to what the interviewee prefers. Um, and remember, you are the interviewer, which so that means that you're requesting the conversation and you're expected to lead the conversation um, with questions. What do these help you with? Um, so they help you access industry specific information. Um, so again, as part of that exploration process, 
Um, we as career advisors, there are two people who work in our office, myself and Francesca, um, and we're generalists. We can't, you know, we work with the entire graduate school of arts and sciences. So we don't know, um, you know, a student might ask, um, you know, what are, in, what are interview questions for this kind of job or what are, um, what's the timeline for, you know, hiring in this, you know, for this company. And sometimes our answer is, well, I don't know. <laughs> and sometimes the best way to find that out is by talking to somebody in that industry. Um, so it's really important as you think about your um, kind of team of mentors that's going to, that's going to help you in this process to get a few people in that group who can um, give you that industry specific information. Also through these conversations, you can identify skill and knowledge gaps. So that's where you can ask like, um, you know, do I really need programming? Like, do I need programming skills for, for this job? Or um, are there other functions within this industry where um, those skills might not be necessary? And then if the person says, oh yes, you know, you do actually need it, then you can ask them too. Oh, great. You know, do you have any, any ideas of how did you acquire those skills? Or do you, um, you know, do you know how people go about that? Next, learn about possible career paths. So just hear people's stories and learn, um, you know, how what their full trajectory was and how they got from one thing to another. Next, and this is one that I think is sometimes overlooked, gain confidence about your own professional identity and interviewing skills. So when you have these informational interviews, you get a chance to introduce yourself, tell your own story. Um, kind of figure out what your own, what your narrative is, and you can do that in a lower stakes setting than if you're in an actual job interview. So it's kind of nice practice in that way. Next, of course, expand your professional network. So informational interviewing is part of networking, and that's um, so. When I filled out, uh, when you all filled out the little bubbles at the beginning, um, I'm actually going to look back at that now because I didn't see kind of where it fell. Um, all right, so one person doesn't like networking, but some of you feel ambivalent and a few of you said you actually kind of like it. So, um, and networking is really just an informational interviews. It's talking to people who have common interests as you. Um, and so I think if you think about it that way, it can make it a little bit easier. And then these people do become part of your network, um, right? It can become part of your network and people you can draw on in the future. Next, and, and I'll say this last, is to find out about hidden opportunities. So people think about networking, um, I think a lot of times the negative connotations it has is because it can feel transactional and it can feel like you're doing it um, just to get access you know, to a job. Um, and honestly, that's, that happens um, rarely that it, you know, you'll have an informational interview, they, you know, someone kind of hands you a job. Like that doesn't really happen these days anymore. But you can find out about things you didn't know about. So for when I when I say hidden, it could be, um, yo, you know, this position, you know, my team is actually growing and we're, we, it's not posted yet, but we're going to be hiring, you know, for a whatever. So that's a hidden opportunity because it's not out there yet. And then you can know, you can be one of the first people to apply. Um, it could also be hidden just because it could be something that's not on your radar. Um, you know, you could talk to somebody and they'll say, oh, I know you're interested in this, but actually like, what if you, what do you think about, you know, this other thing? And so it can, again, oh, just open up opportunities that you hadn't thought about. So that's incredibly valuable. Um, it can also help you check your assumptions that you have about things. So I always encourage people before they kind of cross something off of a list. And again, this is something I see a lot. And I think it might be sort of a product of imposter syndrome that's common in academia is feeling like you're not qualified for something. But I always encourage people to just to do an informational interview uh, or a couple of them first, just to see if you're right about that um, and ask some questions about the things that you, you're concerned about to see whether they are myths um, or if there's actually some truth to them. Next, who should you talk to? Um, so I think it's always a good idea to start with those who you already know. Um, so think through your friends, family, peers, um, even like faculty who you're close with, just uh, to see, you know, maybe it's someone who you have a personal relationship with and you haven't really talked to them about work very much, but just kind of start bringing up those conversations to see if maybe you actually already have some people in your network or um, you know maybe a close maybe one of your advisors or a faculty member maybe they have a partner or um, you know another of their family members who's in a field that you're interested in so just start kind of bringing this up with people um, to see who comes through the cracks here 
And after that, um, look, think about warm connections. So these are people who have some kind of association with you. So they'd be kind of natural, um, more likely to say, accept an invitation if you were to send a cold email to them. So this would be alumni from any institution that you've gone to, not just Columbia, but also undergraduate or even high school, depending on where you grew up. Um, professional association members or scholarly associations. So um, I encourage all of you to go to the websites of your respective scholarly societies. So whether that's the American Sociological Association or Modern Language Association or American Academy of Religion, um, they all have professional development. Um, they all do professional development and work. And if you go to all of their websites, you'll find some resources about this. Um, and in some cases, even um, mentorship programs or um, even like you can see the people who are on those committees and reach out to them. Um, so these are all great places to look. Next, um, guest speakers, event participants. So just kind of scrolling through your memory um, or plotting out what you're going to do going forward of people who you've heard present or um, you've been on a panel or you know, something that you've attended, someone you've, you know, so the, the idea is like someone who, even if they don't know you, when you reach out to them, you can say, oh, I attended this, you know, event, and I thought what you said was really great, I'd like to follow up. Um, and in order to do that, you have to put yourself out there to go to things a little bit. Um, next, any kind of like mentorship program that you can participate in as a mentee. Um, and then finally, LinkedIn. Um, so it, it is a great place um, to find some of these potential connections and people to do an informational interview with. Okay, finally, so just, um, there's a, a great resource that's actually um, connected to in our resource library in GSAS Connect um, that has, um, really lays out you know how to send that initial cold email asking for an informational interview what kinds of questions you should ask how to follow up afterward but basically um you know again you're leading the conversation and the conversation should have somewhat of a trajectory to it so you want to go in very prepared with a list of questions um, you want to start by introducing yourself and explaining why you're interested in talking to the person and then begin asking them questions about themselves. So usually you'd want to start with the present, asking them, can you tell me about your work, about what you do, about your organization? Next, you might want to ask them about your trajectory. So uh, about their trajectory. So like, how did you get this job? Um, what did you do before? Um, what, would, what was your first job out of graduate school? And kind of how did you move from thing to thing afterward? Um, another question, kind of an optional question, is where the person sees themselves going next. Um, if you're curious about where their trajectory, um, you know, what the advancement opportunities are or where people, um, what the kind of different trajectories are that people go after those positions. Um, and then finally, um, this, these last questions, uh, Roman numeral four, do you have any last advice? These things could be things you ask verbally during an informational interview, or they could be things that you follow up with in an email afterward, asking, um, do you have specific recommendations for you know, other people to talk to or other organizations to look at? Um, this is something, you know, if you have a really good rapport with someone, you could say, would you be willing to take a look at my resume? Um, that's sort of a high level engagement. So I wouldn't do that unless you have like a really um, positive interaction with someone, but you definitely can do that. Um, and then asking about um, anything, you know, just advice for things you should pursue in the future. Okay, so that was quick, but so now what, um, what are the next steps? Um, so first, um, people often ask about what, it, what my time, what their timeline should be. Um, and a job search can take months from beginning to end and it's cyclical. Um, so what I, what I always suggest is start with your anticipated graduation date. So if it's like May, 2022, um, anticipate that this self-assessment and research and exploration process that we've been talking about today will probably take a couple of months. Um, and then including that kind of networking, um, that can take a few months to look into all these options, to make some connections, to understand um, you know, what the possible job titles might be, where you would look for jobs in that industry. Um, so this is good. If you are graduating in May, this is a really good time to be here right now and starting this. Then it's gonna take you a few weeks to start. Um, if you haven't already, 
um, translated your CV into a resume. That'll take a little while. You'll have to go through a few iterations, ideally share it with some people. Um, and then finally, once you start submitting applications, I, I put four to six months on this slide. It really depends. I mean, if you get, if you end up getting a job, it could be, you know, you could go from submitting to having an offer in a month, you know, you could, it could move very quickly. Um, but realistically, I think it does tend to take people a few months of submitting applications, going through interview processes until you have a job offer. Um, the good news is that the, you know, the economy has picked up a lot since the last time I did this presentation, actually last spring um, and, um, and in a lot of industries. So that's, that's the good news is that we were seeing students that are taking a very a longer time to get jobs and we're not seeing that as much now. In thinking about your next steps, um, it's a good idea to set SMART goals and SMART is an acronym that stands for a specific measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Um, so what does that mean? Um, here are some example goals. So it should be something very specific, um, like complete the Imagine PhD assessments. Um, it should be something that is measurable, um, complete all three assessments, okay? It should be something that's achievable. This is definitely achievable. It should have given an even shorter deadline. Um, it should be something that's relevant, um, very relevant to your um, career exploration and time bound. So give it a deadline. Um, and this I think is, can be a really great tool for holding yourself accountable um, to continuing this exploration process is to setting these um, SMART goals. Okay, so I am, that's, the end of the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and